All right, off we go. So, um, let's just crank really quickly through this um, CTCR document on death and get this thing done, okay? And then we can move on from there. So, this is from way back, 69. This is not long after the CTCR was actually even brought into existence, you know, because shortly after its inception. And so, they were asked to talk about death, which is a pretty radically hard thing to discuss and really controversial. Actually, not at least at all. Um, but there are some things that are here that are pretty helpful. Anything stand out to you or any questions about anything in the CTCR document or anything that stood out to you as singularly significant? Yeah. Well, only, I guess, as much as, I mean, as much as we talk about, um, you know, the interim state and then the resurrection, I wonder, you know, there are times when, you know, Luther even uses the term heaven. Mm -hmm. And even, you know, in our small catechism, um, you know, what's the phrase? Uh, give us a blessed end and take us to himself in heaven. Yeah. You know, I went, I, just to know kind of... Yeah, and this, and this CTCR document uses this term a lot, and we hear about this a lot. So this is a good place to talk about that. So that's fine. We can, we can, we can hit this. So I'll hit this in just a minute. Anything else in the CTCR document? Yep, Josh. There is talk about sometimes one body or something, the body going up. So what do you mean by that? Elaborate some more. Mm -hmm. One of them would say, they want to say just the soul went up and they talked to like the whole person. Well, the whole point of the resurrection is you've got a body and a soul resurrected, which is the whole, the whole significant point. I'm guessing that was the, the point there. Okay? Nothing else. The other thing I think it's worth talking about in here is this whole Sha'ol stuff. Okay? Now, you guys cover this, I'm assuming, somewhere along the way in your exegetical courses, or not? <laughs> Why would you? It's just an Old Testament idea. Brian? I was going to say, maybe give like a very concrete like, explanation. Know what Sheol is, and they just they kind of leave it alone. And well, it's because nobody knows what to do with it. Why not? That's my point. But they say, like, oh, this is it, and then they move on. Like, we know what it is, and I don't know. Well, yeah, so what is it? So what is Sheol? It's where dead people go. Okay, next. And that's the whole problem. See, that's what you get. Well, it's where dead people go. Okay. But, but wait a minute. Because, and see, okay, that's the easy answer. Shaul is the place where dead people go, go. So then the question that comes to mind, if you've had any kind of education in the classics at all, is, so what's the difference between Shaul and Tartarus? Right? You guys know what I'm talking about? Tartarus? What's that? It's the place of the dead. Sharon takes you across the river and you arrive in the place of the dead. And the place of the dead is just where dead people go. Sounds like Shaul. And so, what's wrong with that? That's a straightforward, nice, clean answer. Seems to fit what's going on in the Old Testament. You know, we go to Sheol, no one remembers you anymore, and you can't praise God from Sheol, don't want to go to Sheol, oh, save me from Sheol. Okay, you get this kind of stuff. So, all right, so that's where dead people go, and it's kind of a shadowy, murky place down in the center of the world sort of idea, and that's the end of it. And we're all done, Old Testament's done. So what's the obvious elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about? What happens? Well, what happens? What's the other kind of the bigger problem for us as Christian believers? Sheol is kind of a neutral. It's neither heaven nor heaven. Yeah. Yeah, so what do you, well, and then we don't even know how to get a purgatory here yet. So we've got heaven, and we've got hell, is what we believe. And so then the question is, well, which one is Sheol? Or is it both? Or neither? What's going on here? And so then we have the question of, so are we teaching an Old Testament eschatology versus a New Testament eschatology? I mean, they're in conflict? Now, that would be a first, because everything I've been trying to teach you all along is there's no conflict. And we don't have these radical disjunctions between OT and NUT, but we have a continuity. But now we have this whole Sheol business, then we have heaven and hell. And you have to look really hard for anything in the OT that smells like either one of these. Even though you get references in Job to, with my eyes I will see him, which seems to go even further, indicating a resurrection. And you get Daniel talking about the righteous will shine like the stars. Okay, that sounds kind of cool. But they're pretty, pretty vague. Now, what, so how do we handle this? How do we answer this discrepancy or this difficulty? Anybody want to take a run at this? What do we do with this? Yeah. Do I? Holding place before Christ. Okay, a holding place before Christ. We're going to introduce a new doctrine that there was this holding tank for a while. Now, has that been suggested in the church? In fact, what do we often call this? There's a name for it. 
Abraham's bosom, maybe, probably, I think Abraham's bosom is probably more like this one, but maybe you could go that route. No, it's not purgatory. All right, here we go. Let's get all of our terms up here. Let's, let's do this. this is, we're going to create our eschatolo eschatology lexicon, our dead people lexicon. What's the other one that's not up here yet? Limbo. There you go. All right. Coleman gets the gold star, the one he was yearning for. All right. So purgatory, limbo, Sheol, heaven, hell. All right. Let's unpack these a little bit. Oh, I know. You're just racking them up. This is pretty good. All right. So what's going on? So let's get some clarity. This terminology, purgatory and limbo, comes out of Roman Catholicism primarily. The church, mother church kind of stuff. It's been around for a long time. They're not the same thing. Protestants are notorious for confusing these and not knowing what's going on, getting stuff really muddled. So when we're talking about purgatory, what's purgatory from a Roman Catholic understanding? Coleman. It's the place where... Uh, Punishment, or, or you are purified. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a temporal punishment to to work off the sins that you or what you the what you accumulated in this life. Okay, you're uh, you're in the, exactly on the right track, Tim. Add to this. But only Christians go there, right? Only Christians go to purgatory. Purgatory is the place where you go if you were on the right track. You were part of the church, you were participating in the means of grace, you were going where the sacraments were, you were on the right track, you were doing the right things, but you weren't perfect. You had not arrived at full, complete righteousness yet. You weren't fully justified yet until so you died before you got good enough. Now, it'd be a tragedy to send somebody to hell who was at least trying, and so purgatory seems the reasonable thing you come up with. So you send a person who is at least on the right track to purgatory, and then there they can finish it up. Wrap up whatever's left undone. You know, it's like getting an extension on your paper. You know, just wrap it up. You get a little more time, get things wrapped up. So you go to purgatory, wrap things up, and then when you're cleaned up, and literally what does purgatory come from? Purgation, purging, cleansing, cleaning. So you get cleaned up purged of your sins. You've paid them all off. And now, what that's done, now you can step into the next level and now you can enter into heaven or the beatific vision, which is the pinnacle of heaven. So you got all these degrees, which is where you just gaze at God, blissed out. Oh, and that's eternity. We'll, we'll get to that one later. Um, so purgatory was the process, but only Christians go there and you, and you finish paying for your sins. And by the way, purgatory is not pleasant. Purgatory is hell with an end date. You suffer in purgatory. You got to pay for your sins. So it's not like you're just, you know, rocking in the chair or watching the time go by or doing hard time in solitary confinement. It's not like being in prison. Purgatory is like being tortured to pay for your sins until they all get paid for. So it's a lot smarter to do your penance here on earth and get it done rather than putting it off to purgatory. And this also then becomes part of the great motivation for the whole plan of indulgences. You see how this kind of fits into the, the wonderful medieval system. So you have somebody who dies, they're, a, they're up there languishing in purgatory, and you're still here on earth, and you can do something to alleviate their problems. You can pray for them, you can ask the saints to intervene for them, because the saints who have a super abundance of more grace than they need can always kind of make a withdrawal from their grace bank and make a deposit for the sake of someone you're praying for. And that makes sense. So you can pray hard and get a little grace shaken loose for Grandma Schmidt up there, and that's kind of nice. Well, not only can you pray for them, but, you know, if you make a significant donation, the Pope has authority to be able to whack off some of the time in purgatory. ta -da! Pretty cool. And now, now you've got a real great business model. Because now you can peddle this and say, you know, you didn't treat Grandma Schmidt very well in her day. And in fact, you were exceedingly cheap at her funeral. And you should feel pretty guilty about that. But you can do something for her now. And think about her up there. She's just languishing and burning. And she maybe deserved a little bit of it. But now, come on, you know, she needs to have some mercy. You can help her out. And for a couple thousand, you can have a guarantee that we're going to get her right out of purgatory and slide on into the beatific vision. How about it? And this... This was selling like crazy. This was a great business model. That's the whole thing in purgatory. That's what it's all about. That's what's going on there, okay? Now, what's limbo? Was it the place where the, everybody who died in the Old Testament was waiting? Kind of. Kind of. Yes, Brian. 
Limbo is the place where you send somebody who's not ready for heaven because they're not in Christ, but they don't really deserve to go to hell because they're not really bad. Good pagans. So Plato's in limbo. Aristotle's in limbo. Socrates is in limbo. And yeah, maybe some people might do that with Pilate. Probably most people wouldn't. But so limbo is where you send good pagans. And people, especially like Aristotle, I mean, you've got the whole entire medieval system built on Aristotle. You can't have him in hell. So, but he can't be in heaven because he's not a Christian. So you just put him in limbo. So limbo is where you go. And conveniently, limbo is where you put anybody you're not sure what to do with, like unbaptized babies. So if you're in the Catholic Church, somebody says, what about unbaptized babies? We got an answer for you. No question marks, just limbo, which is kind of a drag, but it's not bad. It's not like party, but it's not like, oh, I'm in agony here because you're just existing. You know, chat with Aristotle for eternity. That's not all bad, I guess. Coleman. Because you can exit purgatory. <laughs> I think not. I, I won't claim to be an expert at this. Okay? So I think not. So that's what we have here. Now, what do we do with Sheol then? Back to that. So is Sheol limbo? Is Sheol purgatory? What is it? Well, you get the sense when you come across it in the Old Testament that it's bad. Yeah, it's not a positive thing, is it? Death and grave and pit. Yeah. All right. Okay, good. Chris? Uh, it's a place where God isn't. It's a place where it seems to be a lack of God's presence. And it's not a positive thing. All right? But the problem we have is we have even believers in the Old Testament talking about going to Sheol. And that's where things get difficult. Yeah, Max. It, when I read it, a lot of times it just sounds like it's just talking about the death itself, uh -huh. if that makes sense. It's yeah. not as, it's, lo it's, lo it's locative, but... It's not thinking so much about this next thing. Yeah, for the most part it's about this just... The temporal sense event. Of being mm -hmm. not not life. being present in this life and in this, in, this, in this world. Correct. Now, here's how I'm going to run at this, and this is my, my way of dealing with Sheol. I would say that Sheol is not purgatory, Sheol is not limbo, and Sheol is not the equivalent of um, Tartarus or, you know, the place of the dead. Okay? It's not that. So I would say Sheol is something kind of different. Sheol is the Old Testament concept they have of that there's, an, there's a continuation of this existence beyond this life, and so they know that. So in other words, the human being endures. Doesn't, annihilation is not even an option. You, it endures. But we don't have a full eschatology yet. And this is an example of what I would call the sort of unfolding of Revelation. And you'll get this quite a bit if you start paying attention to Old Testament stuff, and I think you probably have been taught this. For example, you have Genesis 3.15 where you have the proto-evangel, where you have, you know, he will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. Well, that's a reference to Christ. Maybe not everybody recognized that, but we, that's what's going on there. But it's just incipient, very small, pretty vague. Then we get later on, we get a little bit more. Isaiah 53 starts giving you a whole bunch of stuff about what this is going to look like and what this Messiah is going to do and what's going to happen. And then you get references in Micah and other places where it starts, you get a fuller picture. So you see, the revelation starts opening up. You're starting to see more and more and more. And you get this. And then Christ comes and it's like, oh, now we're getting it even more clear. So I would say what Shul Ol is, is sort of like the bud of of eschatological teaching. It's, we know that there's a continuation of life after death, but we don't know much more than that yet. And so it's not like Sheol is heaven or Sheol is hell. Sheol is just a sense of, we keep on living and we're not in this life anymore. And I think you're on the right track, Max, that, you know, we're no longer part of this sphere. And so, but we don't know much about this yet. But there are clues, and God gives hints through the prophets and stuff, and that's why you get things like Daniel shining like the stars, and you'll get Job with the kind of confidence even in her resurrection. And we get the sense of, you know, the people are walking with God in Enoch. So there are hints, but it's not real clear yet. And it becomes clearer when we move into the period of the New Testament with Christ's teaching and then with the epistles. We get a clearer picture of the distinction, and so we have this kind of opening up of the revelation. That's how I would look at this, and that's how I've tended to treat, to treat Sheol. Chris? In mind, uh, I can't quote the exact song off the top of my head, but I think of where David says, who will sing your praises when I go down to Sheol? Right. And I wonder, well, if it's a place where God isn't, uh, it, would it be then, and if, but, if it's, but it, does it then involve 
praise for God. Well, see, I would say I'm not sure. I would say it might be going too far to say it's a place where God isn't. David's simply assuming, you know, I can only praise you if I'm living. And if I'm dead, how can I praise you? And so in the context of the psalm, what he's really saying is, God, keep me alive so I can keep on praising you because if I'm dead, I can't. And he's basing that on his limited knowledge of what happens after they, they die. It hasn't been fully revealed to him yet. That's how I would deal with that. Yeah, look. I one thing you could say definitively, though, is it isn't heaven because they did have a heaven word. That's, you know, that's, that's true. You know, well, they would say, but know, the heaven word really just meant stuff up there. And so it wasn't quite the same thing. Okay, next. I think, it, I mean, to me, because it is talking about an unknown thing in a lot of senses, the point is that there's a recognition that death is, is the negative thing. So Correct. That's the that are the, Correct. The followers of Yahweh are still not so... And there's the continuity. There's the continuity. Because, see, we don't embrace Sheol. We're not eager to die even though the Old Testament can say, blessed in your eyes are the, are the death of your saints. So even the Old T can say this. Okay, that's true. And yet, Sheol is not a positive thing. And death is not a positive thing. So I think the smart thing to do is kind of what Max is saying is we equate Sheol with the actual non-existence in this immediate life. That's kind of the big point. And it, don't read more into it as, well, it's incipient heaven or it's incipient hell. No, really, it's just we are continuing to exist, but we're not here in this life, and more will have to be forthcoming. All right, Coleman? I was going to ask you, how does this contrast with um, like Isaiah's thoughts of the highway or the feast of fatted meats or any of those other... Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the, the mountain and Yahweh's mountain and all that kind of stuff. Yes. Is this a contrast to this? Yeah. This, this, in a sense, what you're getting with Isaiah, with Isaiah is he's looking ahead and he's seeing the full last day. And we'll talk about that when we read the next CTCR document, the one I thought we were reading today. But that, that will come in there. The whole idea of Isaiah is looking ahead, and what he's really prophesying toward is the full, the full deal. Everything's coming together. You know, the lamb and the lion laying down together. That's at, the, that's at the resurrection. That's not, you know, in the interim state. That's the resurrection state. So he's, he is getting a glimpse of this. So like I said, there are, there are hints. There are glimpses already there at work. All right. Good? Now... So, back to this discussion about heaven. The other thing I want to just get out of the, CTC, out of the CTCR document is the, even the language heaven. Um, I am not real fond of this word, and especially when I'm talking about people dying and what happens next. And you've noticed I tend to be rather careful of this. I don't like using the word heaven because when you say somebody dies and goes to heaven, well, what are the liabilities with that? What's, what's the problem? Why would I be maybe less than thrilled with that? And why maybe should you consider carefully your language? Tim? Uh, it's that discussion we had yesterday after you're separating soul and body. And so when you say you're going to heaven, that usually means that you're leaving your body behind, and that's a good thing. All right, good. So this, I think, enhances a lot of this Gnostic antibody kind of stuff. Okay, so that's one of the problems. Other problems with talking about dying and going to heaven. Yeah, Josh. You're in the angels. Well, okay, yeah, turn into angels, the angels fly around in heaven. So that's part of this. Coleman? Kind of it's tangent to what Tim is saying. Uh, it doesn't, there's no restoration of creation. All right. All right. It has a tendency, and this is one of the, this is, you guys are all on the right track here with this. What this tends to do as we talk this way is, is it jumps over the interim state and it collapses it. So it's like heaven becomes the goal. I want to go to heaven. Well, heaven is the goal, right? Well, yeah. So if I die and go to heaven, cool, we're there. And we're, we're equating what happens in the interim state with the eschatological fulfillment. That's a mistake. And that gives people, in a sense, uh, a truncated hope. They're not looking forward to the resurrection of the dead anymore. Now they're just content to just die and get to go fly around up into heaven. And it's, it's the wrong goal. It's not the right purpose. And there's the other side of this is, when we talk about heaven, we're often leaving out the recreated earth, right? Because New Testament's real clear on this. New heavens and a new earth. And if we just talk about going to heaven, and when you, when the new earth is just kind of left out of this, so that when you start to teach scriptural truth, like, well, you know, the world's going to be recreated, you get these kind of shocked looks from people's eyes. I thought only Jehovah's Witnesses believe that. I mean, you believe that? And it's stunning how you can have Lutheran believers who are just totally blown away by the idea of a resurrected body and of a recreated earth. They're just stunned at the thought. And, and I chalk a ton of it up to years of being told about dying and going to heaven as the goal. 
When I die, I want to go to heaven. No, when I die, I'm going to be waiting for the resurrection. That's the big deal. That's my hope. So the Christian hope is not heaven. The Christian hope is the resurrection. That's what I'm getting at here. And so that's why I will even go so far as to say, because we have a new heavens and a new earth, and because we have a resurrected body, I would say the ultimate hope of the believer is the eschatological fulfillment at the end of time when Christ returns and recreates all things. That's my hope. And so <laughs> I've gotten to the point where when I'm even teaching in my Bible class, and I won't say the word heaven, I'll say eschatological fulfillment at the end of time. And it just becomes, you know, kind of standard. And you say it quick enough, and people are kind of like, I don't know what you mean. You mean heaven, but you don't want to say it. Exactly right. And so, but I think that's on the right track. So the eschatological fulfillment, that's the hope. The, the end times fulfillment, the restoration, the recreation, that's the hope. That's what I'm looking forward to. And I'm not content with a heaven especially when it becomes the dry ice fog that we're all walking through with these shadowy kind of see-through figures. No thanks. That's not the hope. And that's why I want to push against that. Now, I think the CTCR document does a nice job of working through all this stuff and making things pretty clear-cut and pretty straightforward. And I, and I would commend it to you for that purpose. Any other questions or comments about the CTCR document? Thanks another comment. Just, yeah. I like the fact that you did you know, kind of clarify, hey, there are a couple different ways that Scripture talks about the soul yes. you know, and, and what it is. And so I thought it was just a very concise. And yeah, and the thing that comes through here, the thing that comes through here, which I was stressing last time, and I appreciate this, and I, I would say this document could even pound on this a little bit harder. But in 69, maybe they weren't thinking about this as clearly yet as they needed to. But we still have this kind of sense of this, du this dualism or this duality. And so we get this kind of um, soul-body thing going, and we see the human as kind of this pulling together. But the document does note, actually, Scripture talks this way sometimes, but they usually have a much more concrete way of talking just about the unity. The nephesh and the ruach are just kind of, this is the life. This is the person. So the human being simply is all of this together. And it's not like, as I said last time, you got the body with the little slot for the soul to drop into. Now you're a human being, and we can just kind of neatly pull that soul out, and now here's the real you. Where are we going to put you next? You know, No, you are completely enmeshed in your body, and your body and your soul is just one you, just one unity. And I think... On, you know, even on our self-reflection, we get this. We, we become aware of this, and, we, and we're conscious of this. And that's, that's the real stress to make here. And to make the body-soul duality is not really very helpful. And so then, when you start functioning this way, then that old question which used to really get people fired up, well, is it a duality or is it a tri, tri, triality kind of thing? You know, is, is it a, do we have body and soul, or do we have body-soul-spirit? You know, what's going on here? What's the real teaching? And the right teaching is, it doesn't matter. We are these one unified creatures, and we have body, soul, spirit. If you want to go soul, spirit, that's fine. You want to make that kind of distinction. But frankly, we are simply spiritual beings who are physical beings together all the time. That's the main point. All right, good? All right, let's go to long. So, the life to come. <clears throat> and this is interesting because this was actually a lecture he delivered here on campus. Okay, and do anybody know Thomas Long? Any, yeah, Coleman? He wrote the book that we use for preaching, I thought. Yes, so he is a homiletician. This is his forte, and that's why he was here, actually. So he was a renowned homiletician, and um, that's his kind of his credit, and people know him for this. So he's quite an accomplished preacher. He was on campus here for, the, as I said here, this lecture, lecture back in 95, and then this was subsequently published then after he gave the lecture. So that's, that's who this guy is. So what do you think of this essay? Luke? Other than having various side tangents, I thought he was pretty good. Wow, side tangents. Uh, so like that's so disparaging. He likes telling stories, but that's not <laughs> that. But That's only the whole point. <laughs> the fact that he was able to kind of put them all into three large categories. All right, we'll get to that. This is the, this is the concrete, the very linear, okay, give me an outline, and he does that. Yeah, all right. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to hear that, Luke. <laughs> We'll work through that. All right, good. So he has some nice clear-cut stuff. Other thoughts, what'd you think? Nothing? Did you like this article or not? Coleman? I was expecting a systematic article and it was very much a, a homiletic. I mean, the, the whole All first right. 
story of the, the Christmas and Thanksgiving was like, what? Yeah, he spends two pages telling this great story about Christmas in Atlanta and the bears dancing and everything. And, and then a story about the daughter wanting to dance. And, I, yeah. and, and that was, that pulled at the heartstrings, but it still was still yeah. kind of like, what, is this, what, what does this have to do with? All right, now let's, we got two of these to do today. We're gonna do the same thing with Creefture in a little bit, if we have, as time allows. But there's a, lot, there's a larger lesson to learn here, and this is what I'm doing here towards the end of this class, because here you are at the end of your, end of your whole systematic sequence before you head off to Vicarage and forget everything for a year. And so it's time to start bringing some things together and start jumping up to a higher level. So is Long doing systematics? He is. He's not doing them like Peeper. No, no, indeed. And in fact, it's kind of annoying to some of you because he keeps on clouding the clarity with all these stupid stories. And some of you had that reaction. Brian. My response to the stupid story kind of thing is, well, at least he's not uh, repeating the same thing for 30 pages. All right, well, who would do that? <laughs> don't, don't say anything. We don't disparage anybody around here. I don't know who would do that either. All right, so... At least he's not being boring. All right, now, is there more to these stories, or are these just illustrations? What is going on here? What do we take away from this? Is there anything to be taking away from this? Josh? Well, what I liked about the East West East, these the stories, I think Creep got a hold of this, too, is it's not just, um, like, it's not just supposed to affect our minds. It's supposed to fill us with something. It's supposed to affect our whole being. All right. All right. I would tend to agree. Anybody else? Some thoughts or reflections on this. All right, here's the big nitty-gritty lesson on this, and this is just kind of the background underneath thing. You're going to read stuff from time to time. You're going to encounter things, and it's going to seem maybe a little bit embellished or fluffy or stories, and the hardcore systematician, and you just, you know, give me the hard facts. But you see, the reality is systematic theology is telling God's story. It's a story. It's a narrative. That's what it's all about. And so the very idea of the narrative encapsulating of the, of the truth should make us far more sympathetic and even eager for those who are able to convey truth in narrative ways. And I think that's what's going on here. And so instead of just kind of tolerating the stories as mere illustrations, in a sense, I think there's something powerfully communicated by the stories themselves and the narrative itself. And it communicates things in ways that are, I think, exceedingly helpful. Yeah, they're illustrations, but they're, in a sense, more than that. You get what I mean trying to say here? And here's the thing I want you to mostly take away from this. There's even something that's, in a sense, more true or more truthful than simply a bare listing of systematic facts. And it's tempting to just kind of go for the clean, neat, academic, give me the bullet points, boom, 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 there. That's systematics. And people have that sense of neat and clean and comforting and very engineering-ish. Not to diminish that, Luke, but I'm attacking it, yes. Um, and so there's something about that that's, that's appealing to us. But in fact, theology is a lot messier than this. And theology is a lot more intuitive and experienced. And theology is actually narrative-bound. And it's not like the narrative's embellished, but the narratives are the truth. And in a sense, now here's the real kicker, and in a sense, to reduce it to bullet points is to diminish the truth and to lessen the reality. Do you get that? And see, now I want you to appreciate that. For the sake of learning and communicating, we often boil things down to lists and bullet points and graphs because it's easier to get it across. But that's a diminishing of the fullness. It's a, it's a missing of something. Now, it's a very Western way of operating. It's a very Enlightenment way of operating. We're all trained to do that, and we're pretty good at it. But in a, in a sense, it's a little bit less than God's greater reality. And that's why storytelling and even narrative telling sometimes is more, I would argue, not sometimes, I would argue most of the time is closer to the truth of things than the simple, mere, clean-cut, rational explanation. You track him with me on this? So I'm, I'm encouraging you to be a little more broad in your thinking, your appreciation for how God is communicating his truth and what's going on. So I think Long is doing a good systematic work, and I think he's doing it in the context of the narrative, and I think there's some pretty compelling things in here. All right. Good? Everybody got that? Anybody want to push back on that? Feel free. But see, you're all supposed to be postmodern millennials, so you should all be digging this stuff. 
And instead of me up here telling you to think this way, you should be saying, now, Prof, you're being a little bit too analytical. Where's the story? See, you're supposed to be telling me this because you're the young generation. You're the ones who are all tuned in and cool. I'm supposed to be out of it. See, I'm, I'm an old tail end baby boomer, very tail end. I don't, wanna, I don't own the baby boomers, so that leaves me as a lost generation, which is, I'm content with that. But um, I'm, spo I'm supposed to not know this stuff, and you're supposed to be telling me these things. So does this resonate with you? It should. It's supposed to, unless you've been thoroughly ruined by all your education, which is quite possible. All right. <laughs> On we go. So he starts off with his first two pages about his long, long story and about his crushing realization that all of his dreams were gone. And then he's getting into the whole idea of hope. Now, what's the, where do things start to stand out in here? I think, oh, go ahead, Coleman. Were you, were you asking that question? No, yeah, go ahead. It's not just rhetoric. Go ahead. The paragraph where he's interviewing somebody and they, they basically, they talk about the, uh, the second coming is a nice thing if it's actually true, but if it's not, mm. um, it's, yeah. To literalize, the second coming is to ruin both its beauty and its significance. Right. Um, oh, I thought it was a very like, cool. I agree, and we'll get into this. Yes, we're heading there very quickly. So on the way, on our way toward the nitty gritty of the article, the payoff after all that fluff. All right. Now the other thing to say about this too is, doesn't this is well written? I mean, if you're a lit guy, this is exceedingly well written. And you've got to appreciate that. And I, I guess maybe I, I value that. I, I think this is just really well written. He pulls you along. He does some nice moves. And he makes them a little, whoa, that was cool. I like that. And so this is exceedingly well written. And you've got to at least appreciate that. So, and if you don't, read it again until you appreciate it. Okay? <laughs> this, is, this is good. So on page 357, the... Um, Third paragraph down, second actual paragraph. There is, however, something about our embarrassed silence on the matter of eschatology and hope that points to a deeper truth. We keep our mouths shut about eschatology, not mainly because it sounds crazy and embarrasses us, but chiefly because it is our eschatology that most thrusts us into authentic gospel conflict with the culture. And down deep, we know and avoid that. True or not? I think this is profoundly true. I mean, what do we actually believe about eschatology? Christ is going to come again, visibly. This world is going to end. All human pretensions are going to be brought to nothing, and Christ is going to reestablish his kingdom. That's pretty radical. That puts everything into a new light. And to say that publicly and confidently takes a great deal of courage, and it makes you completely at odds with everything else in the culture. Because the culture, you just got things cranking forever until the world burns out and by then we're all off to another planet following you know our brave leaders telling us where to go and so the idea of an eschatological ending is actually courageous and daring and really draws the line sharply between the world's confession and our confession and incidentally this also highlights the distinction between creation from the christian standpoint and secular explanations for the beginning and that's why I'm increasingly convinced, and this goes back to Systems 1, that the doctrine of creation is one of the most profoundly significant doctrines we have in the church. And it's not about six literal days or proving the young earth or, you know, answers in Genesis stuff. Do not take your kids to Cincinnati. All right? Um, this, is, this is silliness. But the whole point is the doctrine of creation is God has put things together and it matters today. Who cares what happened and how it actually went down? That's not that significant. Interesting maybe for some people, but what matters is it's normative for now. And what's that got to do with eschatology? Because eschatology takes that and then brings it back and brings it back where it's supposed to be and inflates it with everything. And there's the continuity. What was is what will be, only greater. So eschatology fulfills the whole point of creation. It all comes together. Eschatology is hugely important, and so is the doctrine of creation. Both are hugely offensive to the world around us. And creation gets a whole lot more press because people are more willing to talk about it because they can study fun stuff. You can't study eschatology because it hasn't happened yet. But it's equally offensive. And the church is often reticent to speak confidently about creation and reticent to speak confidently about eschatology. Better just to kind of leave those things alone. A little embarrassing. I think Long is quite right here. A little bit honest, a little bit unnerving, but I think he's right. All right, now, so he gets into his actual argument and the concrete, nice specificity that we're all looking forward to. And he gives us how many ways of handling eschatology? Three, four, 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 
three. Four, four. He gives us three that we're going to talk about, okay? He'll throw on another one later, but let's start with this first three. Because he says in a paper on page 359, three forms of eschatology. So let's follow, let's go with three then. All right, so what's his first form of eschatology? Futuristic eschatology. What does that look like? What's he mean by futuristic eschatology? Final judgment. Final judgment, all right. Well, what's he, what's he describing here? Give me a quick rundown, Chris. Kind of, uh, it's just that it's a kind of a disjoint es eschatology, which is no connection to the here and now. It's just, oh, it's all connected. Well, okay, you're already critiquing it, but let's describe what he's describing. What does he mean by futuristic eschatology? You're right. But what does he mean by futuristic eschatology? Because I want you to feel a little disjunction here, guys. Complete, utter annihilation. Okay, the utter annihilation of the of destruction of the world. Go ahead, Adam. The world is doomed. Adam, or Brian, sorry, Brian. That was it's like, it's like the world's going to blow up everyone. The world's going to blow up, everyone's going to die, there'll be nothing. All right, so the world is going to blow up, everyone's going to die, and there's going to be nothing. Now, the thing is, though, so we're looking forward to a, whoa, it's going to be all new creation. It's going to be awesome. This world is just a passing thing. It's going to go. It doesn't matter. Everything's going to be recreated, so don't get hung up on this world. How many Christians in our pews have a futuristic eschatology going? All right, this is the point I want to make here. This is not some kind of, well, just a few hicks in the Southern Baptists believe this. No, this is pretty widespread, and especially among Bible-believing Christians. All right, And this goes hand-in-hand hand with a dismissive attitude towards the material world, and it feeds right into the whole Gnostic thing. Who cares about this world? It's all going to burn anyway. You ever heard this? It's all going to burn anyway. Doesn't matter. Who cares? Doesn't matter. And so, and I hear this from Christians. Just throw my body in the garbage dump. Who cares? I don't need my body. It's all going to burn anyway. Doesn't matter. And who cares? It doesn't matter. Well, see, it kind of fits in that futuristic eschatology. It's like none of this stuff matters. We're going on to the, the final thing. All right. And I think this is a very widespread belief among conservative Bible believing Christians who take God's word seriously. This is what they assume is right. Now, why does Long critique this? Q Chris. Don't miss your cue. Uh, so it's, uh, yeah, the issue is, is that it's completely disconnected from the reality of here and now. Yeah. So what, what, what kind of attitude does this foster toward the life here? It's completely disconnected. And so then what is your attitude toward things in this world? Dismissing. Right. Passing. You're like a pilgrim kind of going. Yeah, I'm just passing through. I don't care. It doesn't matter. So we strip mine the top of all the mountains in the Appalachia. Who cares? Doesn't matter. It's all going to burn anyway. Who cares? Doesn't matter. And see, it's a very dismissive and dis it's not, a, not, not really engaged because my real hope is there. And the pie in the sky and the sweet by and by, that's where my real hope is. And I'm not going to get hung up on things now. And so it, it fosters a kind of dismissive attitude. Is that a Christian attitude? No. You see, it's not. But a lot of people think it is. And you even get that, that song, which Gibbs is going to run down and you're leading for next time, the five things never to say, I'm but a stranger here, heaven is my home, which has got such a horrible tune. <sighs> you know, I am but a stranger here, heaven is my home, life is but a something drear, heaven is my home. Oh, it's, it's beautiful, that beautiful 19th century romanticism, it's Junk. But anyway, it's, um, is it good theology? No! And does it foster? Who cares? Yes! And we don't need more of this. There's plenty of this already. So that's the big problem with the futuristic es eschatology. All right. Saw a hand. Where to go? Brian. So when uh, <coughs> the patriarchs and stuff, and when uh, the author of Hebrews says that, like, talks about them being pilgrims, and mm -hmm. uh, um, they their true, not their true home, or their true, uh, where they're supposed to be is to be with God. Can we talk about um, the interim state and that? And 
we have to we have to be careful on how we handle these kinds of things. And so what do we do with that? So they're living with a deeper another citizenship. What do we do with St. Paul saying we're citizens of heaven out of this world? What's going on with that? And what we have to do is we have to hold that along with a Romans 8 kind of a thing. And we have to hold that with a responsibility to be living in this world as God's Christian people. And we have to hold that with a first great commission of Genesis 126 kind of a thing where we're supposed to be caring for the creation. We have to hold these intention. And so what Paul is getting at and what the writer of Hebrews is getting at in those situations is you're not living with this as the only thing. And so it's the contrast to the two poles. So you can have one which is, who cares, it's all going to burn. But you can have the other extreme with, all that matters is this, let's get fully invested, which is just look around at your world, that's everybody around you. And so we have to watch out for both of these extremes. I mean, isn't our home really the new heavens and new earth? Correct. The eschatological fulfillment of all things. So, so to be the, see how this works? And so if you are a citizen of God's, God's country, well, see, God's country is the new creation. That's God's country. All right. Good? All right. So that's the futuristic. What's our next category? Realized eschatology. And this is going to be one that's probably not as familiar to you, but this is what we got going here. So realized eschatology, what's this look like? Brian? Uh, the eschaton is already happening <coughs> here and now. All right. We're in it. This is it. It's happening. We're living in the eschatology. And so all these promises of this great new world, we're living it. Don't you look around you. The world is an awesome place. We're beating polio. We're defeating disease. We're gonna concert, We're gonna beat cancer. We're gonna we're gonna defeat poverty, and we're we're doing it, man. Okay, so that's realized eschatology. Coleman, um, is it to the extreme that this is what the, that what we are in is the eschatological fulfillment? Was my I mean, there's a part of me that says when Jesus says repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Yes, you know, that all these things are drawing near. That even yes. now that, that that there's an element of truth in Correct. That, but there's also... Because, as you've heard before, and you're going to hear a lot more, we live in this tension of the now, not yet. And that's the problem here. So, futuristic eschatology is really good on the not yet. Realized eschatology is real good on the now part. The right solution is hold on to both at once. So, in other words, are there elements of futuristic eschatology which are on track? Sure. You know, this idea of God's recreation and, wow, the radical disjunction. Are there elements of this that are on track? Yes, there are. So this is one of these times where we don't dismiss either entirely, but we also be careful we don't just simply embrace them uncritically. We see we have to hold these kings in attention. Okay? Um, I was kind of confused on this one. So for them, are, is, are we then bringing in the new... Ab yes, so it's absolutely. our work instead of God's work. That's one of the problems. So we're working really hard, but you can soften that by saying God works through us. We're just simply his conduit, and you can soften that. But it can quickly devolve into a works righteousness, but it doesn't have to. And be careful that you don't criticize it as only works righteousness, because it doesn't always have to be that way. And if you do that, then you get discredited when people are actually doing it for right reasons. Okay, good? All right. Uh, so this is the one that is based off of human progression, right? Yes. So yes. where do where do the parts where we are not progressing well? Well, this is why the whole thing starts to collapse, okay? Um, and his and these these also do correspond. Oh, go ahead. What would they say? What did they say to that? They would say it's just a little setback. You got to see a bigger picture and compare where we are today to where we were 400 years ago. And we're making progress, and they'll point to the things that are positive if they're going to hang on to this. Now, these two, obviously, if you're thinking about this and have looked ahead to some things, these correspond very nicely to old categories of a premillennial view versus a postmillennial view. And we'll talk about that more next time, okay? There's a nice correspondence there. And we'll talk a little bit more about this. But historically, these were much more, both kind of like in competition. But with the advent of the 20th century and then the progression of the 20th century, this has fallen on increasingly hard times. Um, there aren't a lot of people who are thoroughly embracing this anymore. But there used to be a lot more. And this is kind of the classic conservative Bible believing. This would be associated with what kind of people? Social justice liberals, yeah, okay? You know, we're going to make a, a fair world. We're going to fight for human rights. We're going to fight for the rights of women. We're going to fight for the rights of gay people. And that's what we're doing because it's a realized eschatology. We're going to beat disease. That's, that's what's going on. 
Yep. Based upon the uh, the reading, he, he mentions ethics in there uh, when it comes to realized eschatology, uh, and even a little bit with the futuristic one. Mm -hmm. uh, is it fair to say that the realism is definitely the kind of the ethically based understanding? Well, the problem is, this, the, you're, okay, you're on the right track here. Futuristic doesn't give you much of an ethic. Because if it's all just going to be something later, then who cares about now? You don't have much of a basis for anything. And this actually fits in really well with the law of gospel reductionism. You know, just live in the gospel reality and hang on to that. This one is much more ethically interesting and much more fruitful from an ethical standpoint. And so if you're going to criticize these two from an ethics standpoint, this one's far, far better. And that's what he's kind of getting at. Okay? All right, good. I do like how he writes on page 360. Um, this is about the last two-thirds of the page. Lord, if you had been here, complains Martha, Martha, my brother would not have died. Your brother will rise again, Jesus assures her. I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day, confesses Martha, using the language of futuristic eschatology. No, no, Martha. That's the Gospel of Matthew. We're in the Gospel of John. Jesus might well have responded. I am the resurrection and the life. This is great. So in other words, he is, you know, Jesus is saying, no, Martha, I'm here now. And so in other words, what, what Long is getting at is Jesus is stressing the now part. I am the resurrection now. That's what Coleman's getting at. Here I am. I am the kingdom of God present for you. That's true. But there's also the gospel of Matthew. Not yet. Both of them are going on here. All right. Good. So then we go into our third one. And what's his third category? Next page. Demythologized, okay? Oh, nobody wants to try to say it. Is that the problem? Okay, demythologized. All right, who are we following here? Boltman. All right, Rudolf Boltmann. Boltmann was the demythologization of the Gospels. So what Boltmann wants to do is he wants to say, we got these great stories in the Gospels. The stories are just the vehicle, the hidden truth inside. That's what really matters. Don't get hung up on the story. Go for the truth. That's how you demythologize the Gospels. You should have covered this somewhere in, es in an eschatological course. All right? And s you guys give me funny looks every time I say that. Um, I make a lot of wrong assumptions. All right. So, so the whole point is this, that Jesus rose from the dead on the third day as we celebrated Easter. A Boltmanian interpretation would be to say, wow, you know, that's a great story. But what's the real truth here? The real truth is how God brings things back from the dead. And how God makes things new again. And so the poor woman who has been divorced and her life is a miserable mess, and then she finds the right guy and gets remarried and she's resurrected, that's the real Easter message. That's what's going on. And don't get hung up on a tomb and whether or not Jesus is there. That doesn't even matter. And so if you find Jesus' bones, so what? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter because the truth is still there. And it's just a story. And the truth is what matters. That's demythologization. You tracking this? And that's what Bowman's thing is. That's, this is classic 20th century, the demythologization of the Gospels. If you have a quick answer, uh, but not really to chase it, why, that sounds more like it's mythologizing. No, because what they're doing is the myth is the story, and the myth is conveying a deep truth. And see, on this sense... This is kind of reading mythos the way that C.S. Lewis does, frankly. That the, uh, there, are, there are these great myths that are at work which convey profound truths. Don't get hung up on the myth. Go for the profound truth. And there's a sense where this is right. Boltman wants to say, I like that. I'm going to apply it to the Gospels as well. And so then our problem is we say, well, you wait a minute. Um, the Gospels are not just myth or history, and that's the big issue. But he's trying to make the same move. So what he's doing is he's trying to say, let's get away from the myth to the profound truth. So he's... So myth means actually the, the concrete story. That's the whole point. He's going kind of for a classic definition of myth. So I mean, it's basically like an Hinduistic way of looking at scripture, really. Because I mean, you're kind of taking <coughs> like the Vedantic, uh, oh, these are all just conveying larger truths. Pointing to yeah. larger Doing deeper. the exact same thing, basically, with fire. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's kind of the idea. So what does this mean for eschatology, then? Well, how does this play out? Well, the three thing is you have... Just these kind of stories. And so we have a story of God recreating, but it's really just a myth. The real point is that the world is going to be kind of getting more recreated in your own life today. How do you feel that newness coming? Where do you feel an eschatological resurrection? And what's the illustration he uses to capture this? Did you read this? What's his illustration? This is one of the more memorable parts of his story. What's that? The three amigos. 
Ah, this is one of the best parts. And so you've got, you've got the, the whole thing, you know, this is on page three. Oh, I lost my page numbers because I, 362. 362. So you've got Steve Martin. All right, and they're gonna, he's going to talk to the people, the residents of Santa Poco. What he says sounds painfully like many of my own sermons. Quote, in a way, all of us have an El Guapo to face someday. For some, shyness might be our El Guapo. For others, and Guapo is interesting because of what it actually means, but it doesn't matter right now. For shyness might be their El Guapo. For others, a lack of education might be their El Guapo. For us, El Guapo is a big, dangerous guy who wants to kill us. But the people of Santa Poco can conquer their own personal El Guapo, who happens to be the actual El Guapo. And so, it's, it's I don't know, I thought it was funny. Uh, what's good about it is, see, you've got the, you've got the, the problem is the myth is real. And so the demythologization doesn't work when it's actually real. So if Satan is a myth of problems we have, well, what happens if there's a real Satan? What happens if there really is a beast? who is going to slaughter and kill? What happens if there really is an opponent to God? Well, wait a minute. This is just supposed to be a myth. You can't be real, Satan. And see, this is the problem with the whole demythologization is it doesn't take seriously the account, doesn't take seriously the history, and that's a huge problem. So then we end up there at the very bottom of that same page, right before he gets into his new section. And he writes, In the Christian faith, however, progress is not our most important product. We do not believe in progress. We believe in hope. That's awesome. That is absolutely awesome. It's worth the whole essay right there. We do not believe in progress. We believe in hope. So it's not a progression. We're not moving forward. We're not conquering our El Guapos. We're not conquering our Satans. We're not conquering our fears and moving into a greater reality. We're looking for a hope which is coming. All right? And there is a difference. Progress is optimistic because the good lie is already at hand. Hope, on the other hand, is a deep-seated trust in the future that God is giving to us as a gift. Hope, therefore, often appears absurd because it is not based on resources fully visible in the present. Believers in progress need the constant assurance that things are getting better. The hopeful, on the other hand, are, as Christopher Lash remind, maintains, always prepared for the worst. See, this is why Christians are the most realistic people around. We get it. We're not deceiving ourselves. We're not painting rosy pictures. We get it, but we have our hope nonetheless because our hope is grounded in God's promise. It doesn't matter what's going on around you. Our churches are shrinking. Everything's getting bad. Oh no, oh no. You see Christians wringing their hands. Knock it off. Cut it off with stupid hand wringing. Where's your hope? Come on, people. You see, this is, this is the difference. And so it doesn't matter what you're seeing. We're confident in God's promise. All right, then this leads us into his fourth category, which is not a fourth category because all these are lacking. And what's his solution? What's he want to suggest? What's he call it? Future present tense, all right? Future present tense, which sounds a whole lot like what? No, not yet, exactly. Exactly. So this is just his terminology for what is simply the now, not yet. And that's what he's up to here. And he's describing this, I think, very nicely. Awesome quote from Flannery O'Connor, one of my favorites. Okay, in the middle of the page on 363. And to call these, this is the second full paragraph, to call these images poetic and metaphorical, by the way, does not reduce them merely to existential symbols, which work only on the imagination. So in other words, there are poetic aspects to God's promises. There is a sense that there's more truth to this, but it doesn't negate the reality of it. So you've got Flannery O'Connor, once reported to have said at the Eucharist, if it's just a symbol, then to hell with it. You know, that's awesome. And this was actually at a dinner party. I guess Newhouse quotes it as well. She was at a dinner party and some very smart person was talking about, you know, I love the sacrament because I feel this closeness and the symbol of Jesus makes me feel good. This is back in the old days when people talk about these things. And O'Connor wasn't even in the conversation. She just overheard it and said, and kind of under her breath, if it's just a symbol, to hell with it. You know, that's so right. You know, if it's just a symbol of Jesus' body and blood, who cares? What's the point? It doesn't matter. And so these things need to be real. They need to be grounded. And that's, that's what we're getting at here. All right. So we have this sense of this promise. It's coming. It's going to be fulfilled. We have the dancer waiting, the beer barrel polka. Mm, Coleman loved it. He was shedding a tear at that point. But it's okay because his fiance wiped it away. It was all right. <laughs> so she's there for. And so it's, it's all right. 
And so it's, 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 a, it's a strong kind of image here, the sense. And it reminds me of an illustration that Gilbert Mylander uses one place about the sense of anticipation of Christ waiting for us. And um, talking about the, it's the picture of image of a single dancer, you know, waiting for the person to come alongside and join in the dance again. And so God waits for us. It's, it's a nice image, I think. All right. So that's where things go. Then he pushes to the end and he's wrapping this whole thing up. And now we're at um, the second to last page in the whole thing. And this is like the um, third to last paragraph in the whole thing. Fourth to last if you count the last two lines as a paragraph. Now we begin to see the difference between the nine lepers who expressed no gratitude and the one Samaritan leper who did. For the nine, Jesus was in the role of a slave who just did his job. There's no need for thanks in such a circumstance. Heal my leprosy, answer my prayers, take care of my family, give me peace of mind, make my life good. That's God's job, isn't it? Isn't that what the Christian religion collapsed into the present tense is supposed to give us? That's Jesus' duty. You do not say thank you when a slave has only done his duty. But the one leper, the Samaritan, knew that something extraordinary, undeserved had happened in his life. His healing was not a matter of duty, but of grace that spilled over into the present from the future. And so this is the cool sense that the grace that we have now is a spilling back into the present of what's going to happen in the future. And that's where the pre- future present all kind of gets start running together here. And there's actually a loaded word which we use sometimes in systematics and it's called a prolepsis. Okay, have you heard of that one? So the prolepsis, and there's sometimes that um, Pannenberg uses this word of an eruption, okay? And so a prolepsis is something that's going to happen that gets pulled out of its time and kind of parked here in the present, and it gives you a little glimmer of something more full to happen. And what's probably the clearest example we have of a prolepsis that we do on a regular basis? Yeah, Lord's Supper. It's the foretaste of the feast to come. We even sing it in the liturgy. So at the, at the rail, we are communing with Christ. At the rail, we're communing with one another. At the rail, divisions are wiped out. At the rail, we have the full union with Christ. It's a prolepsis of the heavenly banquet, a little foretaste. <clears throat> so I have heard this term exegetically, but I thought it was something that was pointing forward. Well, it, it does. You see, the whole point is, it's something that's coming from the future that gets pulled back into the present. And so when it happens in the present, it makes us point forward again. It draws our attention to what's, where it's coming. But it's actually something that's kind of been pulled back into forward into time, backward into time of what's going to happen there. Kind of like well, back to the future. Okay? That was from my childhood. All right. And then this eruption is the idea that's kind of just... Here it explodes, kind of out of place, and yet it's, it's a delight because it's pointing to this greater reality, this greater sense. And you get these little, these little, ta- these little tastes, this prolapsus of what's to come. And then, yeah, I'll broach this topic. It can even have a sense of these events that are kind of out of time kind of work both directions. Okay? Ah, Coleman, what do you got there? I'm just trying to convince your son the other day that time is like a sphere. Oh, I don't know if I'll go there. Any, any, how many of you have heard of this term? Anybody familiar with this? Sein, no, it's not Szechuan. We're not talking about cooking here. All right? This is Sehnsucht. This is German. Okay? And Sehnsucht is a, is a word which means desire, but it's not lust. It's, it's longing or yearning or almost painful yearning eagerly hoping for something, wishing for something. That's Zainsucht. C.S. Lewis explores this quite a bit. He was really interested in this, but he talks about it only briefly because he says it's so personal and so holy that it's almost like obscene to talk about it. And Lewis believed in this. And what he's getting at is these are these kinds of moments. And I always have a hard time describing this because it's hard to describe, but I think it's kind of cool here, and I think it ties into this whole, this prolepsis. So that you have these kinds of moments sometimes that you experience, and you have a sense of there's something really beautiful and profound about this exact moment I'm existing in right now, and it makes me realize there's something more, and I want that more, but I can't even describe it, but I know it should be there. And I want this moment to not end, but I, it's painful almost, but it's got to keep going. And not everybody experiences this. I've described this to some people, and they just kind of look at you like, but if you've had this, you know what I'm talking about. And usually these things happen in kind of primal situations, like at a beach at sunset. And, you know, it's just like this just extraordinarily incredible moment. The person you love is there with you, and you're just thinking, 
it can't get any better than this. This is just so awesome. And yet in the very glory of the moment, you're, you're suddenly overwhelmed with, there's got to be more. What is that? I, it needs to be satisfied. What is this? And you, it almost hurts. It's so cool. All right? And these things don't happen very often, but they are there. That's what Lewis is talking about, Seinsucht. He associates it with the primal memory we all have of God's original creation. And when we come in touch with these things at these kinds of moments, and it makes us realize there's this moreness. And Lewis would say, this is God's gift to us to put us in sense of eternity and to put us in sense of the yearning for the more. Well, that's why this becomes kind of a proleptic. Not only is it a looking back to how things should, would have been and should have been, but it's also looking forward to when God is going to restore, which is why, okay, Coleman, there is a continuity. The beginning and the end are brought together in the fulfillment, but it is linear because the fulfillment eclipses the former and doesn't just go back. So that's what's kind of going on here. And I think the same soup thing plays into this prolepsis eruption in a kind of both ways at once, and you get these. It's not like you can arrange this. It's not like you can plan it. It's not like every Lord's Supper you're going to have this experience, and it is, frankly, very mystical and rather, you know, kind of an in, in, in internal thing. But if you've experienced it, you know what I'm talking about. And you, you know, you, you get this sense, and you've had these kinds of things, and just like, <sighs> This is, and they just they usually hum unbidden. You don't you don't expect it. Sitting on a campfire, or maybe like sometimes like with your family on Christmas Eve, and it's all just exactly as it should be. And it's just like there's just something about this, and it's just like let this moment never end. That's that's saying sucked. Okay, and I think this is that sense of this prolepsis, and I would argue, and I'm, in, I'm sympathetic with Lewis on this, and you can't pin these things down, it's not systematic, but there's something about the continuity of how God works and builds these things into his human creatures, and we see them fulfilled only in the fulfillment and the not, not yet. And it makes us yearn for this and hunger for this. We're never satisfied with the now. It's just not quite enough, and we get that, and I think that's right. All right. Anything else with this, or long, or anything with the Sein Sook stuff? Ugh, okay. It's always risky bringing that one up, but I, I'm, I'm intrigued by it. What's that? Oh, thank you, Alex. That's very affirming. All right. No, I appreciate it. That's, that's, I know you are. I, you are always genuine, Alex. I never, I, I know that. Unlike some of your classmates who are. <laughs> Profanely ironic. <laughs> Just way too millennial. All right. Good. Let's go to Kreeft. Peter Kreeft. All right. So we had an experience of dealing with narrative theology. What's going on here with Kreeft? What would you think? Oh, Brian didn't like him. Why am I not shocked? <laughs> Yes, you may, Brian. <laughs> this is all the stuff that I got fed in uh, Catholic high school. Is it really? Yeah. Well, you went to Catholic high school. Well, my sympathies, Brian. You, and you can be negative. I went to Jesuit high school. You, oh, you went to a Jesuit high school. <laughs> That's even worse. <laughs> all right. So, all right. You, 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 you are given your complete free pass to hate all this. <laughs> I, you, you have done your time in purgatory. I completely understand. The, the handout we got in ethics class, Will There Be Sex in Heaven? Thank you, St. Augustine. Like, ah. Uh. Okay. All right. Well, I'm glad you um, endured that. No, I'm not glad, but I, I, you're, you're, you have a free pass. You may say anything negative you want about this then. All right. Anybody else? Josh. Anybody else who's not Jesuitly as educated, perhaps? I don't, I don't know any, much about his theology, but I thought it was hilarious in why, why he wrote this book and how, why he said he wrote He's like, either the books are too big for you to understand, yeah. or they're either... <laughs> Too intellectual or too nonsense or don't have enough intellect yeah. and they're completely useless and that's why you need to read my book and I thought it was yeah. like very talking himself up and I thought yeah. it was hilarious. Okay, yeah, that's that's you, authors when do that. It was always a little bit suspicious. Okay, good. All right, anybody else weigh in? What'd you think? Good, Luke. I just thought it was really interesting that following the previous lecture we read this book because I think we would have had a lot of confusion if we'd read this book first. You would think so. Yeah. All right. Perhaps so. Alex. So I, I liked it. I, I struggled with a lot of things about Indeed. it. Um, Good. I, I don't know. I guess, I mean, I could talk for a while, but and I won't. 
I think the biggest thing that hit me was the fact that I, I did my paper on The Odyssey, mm -hmm. which you read. And mm -hmm. So I... Um, it's over there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I might run out. I, I remember it, yeah. Um, so, and, you know, one of the, I guess, one of the lessons through all of the searching for The Odyssey is just the fact that in the end you just let it go. Uh -huh. You know, um, and because the Bible doesn't explicitly kind of tell you specifically the reasons why, right? All of those things. You're right. Like, okay. Good. I'm I'm fine with letting that go. Uh huh. But I think in, and then here you have, you have uh, he's kind of going and going and going and going and going as mm -hmm. far as his logic goes. He's really, really riding off in the sunset. On <laughs> yes, he is. Because of things where like. So you're allowing it over here where, you know, scripture says, like he said in his intro, you know, no eye has seen, no ears heard, no mind has conceived, but he had some other translation on that one. Mm -hmm. um, but with theodicy, like one of the things I noticed here in at the seminary in particular is like once you start to say anything about theodicy, it's almost like whack-a-mole where you're like, hey, I have an idea. Well, shut up. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you can't even you can't even talk about it. Whack-a-mole. <laughs> <laughs> where I feel like going off, you know, you can't go off on a tangent, but here he's just going way. Is it really? Well, and you like that? No, I both okay, hands, both hands. But then yeah. the other thing I was mentioning to Josh too was the fact that suddenly he brought up a couple of C.S. Lewis quotes that were from the Space Trilogy, and, he, and I'm going, I mean, it's a, it's fiction. Although yeah. there's, you know, I, the Space Trilogy is dear to my heart. You know, Good. Good. Not a guy who gets abducted and taken to another planet. I'm. I'm <laughs> Well, okay. Well, yeah, but now, right, now, in fairness, in fairness, the Space Trilogy, you guys are all familiar. How many of you, how many of you read through the Space Trilogy? Everybody needs to read this if you haven't. Um, so the Space Trilogy, as I put it, is, is really kind of bad science fiction, but it's really good theology. And that's what it's good about. So I think it's fair game to actually use it because mostly what Lewis is doing, he's using, he's using the story merely as a vehicle to teach his anthropology. And there's a strong correlation, for example, between the abolition of man, which is a, you know, academic treatise, and especially out of the silent planet. They're almost parallel, except out of the silent planet is a little less painful. And so, um, so it's, it's, I think it's fair game to do that. All right. Now, anybody else want to weigh in? What's your, your initial thoughts on this? All right, so he, he's definitely making some pretty wild connections, and he does his logical things, working things out, and just boom, 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 boom. It's like, okay, dude, you're leaving me way behind. Now, what's going on here, though? Why, what's this a picture of? Why am I having you take a look at this? All right, this is very much the reality. This is all, what's, he, what's he giving you a picture of here, guys? This is, this is go ahead, Brian. In my, in my opinion, I don't think it, like, Almost every, a majority of the things that he's trying to attribute is to the interim state, mm -hmm. like they, 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 I think have more pushed towards um, the realized eschatology. Well, no, no doubt about that. Okay, that's true. I'm wanting you to take a look at this for a couple of reasons. Um, Kreeft is a good example of how Rome does theology. Okay? And it's just a different approach than you guys are used to. And you need to kind of get used to this. Because when you encounter Roman Catholic theologians, um, they're going to pull stuff at you and use stuff at you. And it's going to leave you like, what are you doing, dude? And it's because, and see, he takes the tradition much more seriously than we do. Did you notice this? In other words, if somebody had a vision in the third century, does that count for him? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, part of the history, it's part of the tradition. It's part of the history here. And so, in other words... I don't have a scripture verse there, but I've got something that St. Thomas said. So we'll be good? You bet we're good. On we go. And so this is a different way of doing theology. And this is why I want to show you a little caution. While I stress the importance of the anal analogy of faith and the idea of the continuity of our teaching within the context of the church, we have to be careful that we don't start basing doctrinal positions on stuff that's not grounded firmly in Scripture and it's merely grounded in somebody's experience or somebody's thought or somebody's logical conclusion they reached because they put X, Y, Z and came up with a D. And so we've got to be careful. And he's showing you, I think, an example of what happens when you function that way. In Roman Catholic circles, this is going to be roundly applauded and that's cool, that's good. And see, there's, there's a much more willingness to kind of just engage stuff and just kind of embrace stuff. Will cats be in heaven? Why not? Will my fluffy be there? Well, sure, because my fluffy is part of my reality. He needs to be there. So you're going to, fluffy will be resurrected. Great. Give me a scripture idea for that. Well, there isn't one, but it kind of is consistent. Awesome. You know, and they're content with that. 
And so this is not uncommon, and there are a lot of people even in your own pews who kind of are sympathetic to this stuff will operate this way. What you need to realize is there are theologians who operate this way as well, and Rome especially is very very kind to this kind of way of operating and very um, sympathetic to it. There's a lot of room for that in the Roman Catholic understanding. So I think you're at the stage in your education now where you can read something like this and say, okay, I get kind of what's going on here. This is what happens when you just draw from the whole deposit of faith and you kind of just start making doctrinal things out of maybe stuff that isn't as grounded as it should be. And that's what you start coming up with. Okay? So that's going on there. All right. Now, anything positive in here? Anything that you thought was worthwhile or good, Max? Well, it's alongside of the <coughs> thing of the, well, why not? You know, it, it, from his perspective, away from just the, it's traditional and we can use it and we can work with it yeah. theologically, I, I got a, a sense of his attitude of like, you know, we, you're, the, the, the introduction is absolutely right. So let's be a little more willing to work with people than, than what our stingy, you know, theology might want us to be. All right. And I know from the angle of the tradition, yeah, that's not maybe so great because then you're getting into some trouble. But there is an error. I mean, there, I mean, there's a there's a realm of like you know you can play with it a little bit and allow people to kind of just say something and not be dumb or stupid. All right. All right. Good. Yeah. Brett or Dwight. Uh, I the way that he <clears throat> redefined term is like avoiding kind of going along with that avoiding arguments, like mm -hmm. kind of smoothing it over. So that, and there's value in that. Um, there is definitely value in that, and there's something to be learned from this. Rome is really good at that. Um, Rome just functions with this really wide tent. They accommodate lots and lots of views, and we kind of put up with a lot of stuff. We tend not to be that way in our church, okay, if you haven't noticed. Um, but they're good at that, and there's something to be learned for that, and there's a place for that, especially when there's not clear-cut stuff. And I think the whole point on this whole discussion about the eschatological fulfillment is we don't know a lot of stuff. And one of the things, I'll, I'll just kind of go out and limb here and say this now, is one of the things I do value about Crete is I think he opens up some areas for exploration that most of us maybe haven't considered. And is it possible that what he's suggesting could have some merit? And you, you can't just rule it out because there's no Bible verse that says, well, it's not that way. So it's like, I hadn't thought of that. That's an intriguing idea. And I think that's one of the strengths here. And you're quite right then, just the sense of this Toleration. Just or, an example of that. Yeah. And what his fourth point on purgatory is purgatory is also a place of spiritual education, rather, and he's connected to heaven. It's part of heaven. Right. It's not a place where you do deeds. Um, it's not understood as merit for salvation. It's understood as a place of education. To right. Um, yeah. So I right. could, could maybe accept that. Yeah. Okay. But, I mean, just especially as you point out, some of his individual points really kind of helps you think about, oh, there are some other opinions on that. This is right. a valid, what we might be experiencing. I mean, a lot of people, especially like you get to heaven, oh, I'm just going to know everything. Well, no. no. All right, good. So let's kind of walk through this thing. Is he? Do you think he's on the right track when he says we won't know everything when we get to heaven? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I'd say so. And the, even the sense of will we still be learning stuff at the eschatological fulfillment? I think so. It's what part of human being. I, it, that that kind of resonates, and it actually is kind of an interesting thing because it puts a whole new spin on this. Like I say for a lot of people, a lot of people have this sense that, you know, heaven's like this, you know, celestial, beautiful church service, you know. It's like, oh, the organ and everything. And it's like, man, I don't know about you, but if it's like a church service that never ends, whoa. <laughs> man. <laughs> All right, Coleman, you're pious. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> if 941 is on repeat, and we all have vestments, I'm All right. All have vestments. And lots of incense. Yes. All, right. all right. All right. All right. Chris? Uh, no, I was wondering then, would it be safe to say then restoration uh, defies a lot of people's notions of experiences fulfilled when we get to the essence? Correct. Rather, it's learning how to experience, beginning to experience. So it's almost returning to the infancy. That's right. Human life. That's right. And there's something about that. It's like, maybe. That, I don't think we can rule that out. And I think that's, this is a useful kind of corrective to some of our assumptions we make. That's what I liked about this. I'll confess, I started off there. I, I've always had the understanding of fulfillment as in the completion of what should be, but not, not through an idea that we start again with the 
But see, what should be, that's the whole point, what should be is you're a human who is meant to be in association and community and learning and growing. That's what it means to be human. So when you're a fully human, you're primed for that. Kind of cool thought. Well, and that was actually one of my comments on, on his. He, he got to the point of trying to connect that relationship dot, but there was a point that he just didn't connect it. Like, he, you know, will we know everything in heaven? We'll know, we'll know everything, but we can, like, God will be there. We can go talk to God and, and, <laughs> and learn, you know. Yeah. And he didn't make that kind of, that final connection. So I was kind of surprised with the other things he was making connections on. So okay. Didn't well, but that's, well, as part of that is probably his piety of, you know, the sense that God is so other. And yes, we'll have communion with our Lord, but, you know, what's it going to be like? We don't know. Let's not assume. All right. Page 31. I liked his one just straight up quote. Second line on 31. Third line down. One of the astonishing blind spots in modernity is its unquestioning fixation on equality. Boy, is that ever true. Uh, that's, that's exactly right. Brian. What was it like? One of the parts that I did like about what he wrote was that we're not going to be equal and it's not going to be like um, Buddhism where we're all just kind right. of like mixed together. And also, it's not that we will all we'll all have our own identities, but be equal. Correct. The, the differences are the differences, and that's part of what makes us who we are, and that's cool. And that's, that's awesome. So I think that's really good. Um, skipping a whole head a bunch to page 40. This is the seventh question. He's talking about the whole freedom, free to sin. And he says this really well because he's getting the definition of freedom, I think, very scripturally here at this point. This is the last full paragraph, three lines in. We will be free to be the true selves God had designed us to be, free to be determined by God. This determination does not remove our freedom, but is our freedom. That's exactly right. And this is, we talk about this in my ethics course, that actual freedom, it means to be in conformity with the will of God. That's freedom. And to be in slavery is to be doing what you want to do. That's how Paul defines it. You're a slave to sin. To be free means to be in sync with God's purposes. So when we talk about in heaven we'll be confirmed in righteousness, well then we'll be determined. <laughs> yeah, determined according to God's purposes. That's the ultimate freedom because then you're everything God created you to be. What could be more freeing than that? And see, these things, again, are hard for us to grasp this side of the fall because we're sinful, inward-turned people who think our self-assertion is what makes us who we are when that's really what makes us alien to who we should be. And that, that's, that's, these are cool thoughts, I think. And this is good. All right, good. Clothes, animals, whatever. All right, and good. So that's that. Then go to chapter 6. A couple things just jump out there. Well, actually, before 6, I didn't make you read 5, but this is one of the interesting things. This is what is the communion of saints. And I maybe should have had you read this chapter, too, but I don't want to kill you. Um, and here he goes to Dostoevsky and talks about Brothers Karamazov a little bit. And then he, he makes a kind of a nice move on page 76. Well, let's just hit this all together. So we have this first thing on Dostoevsky, page 75. We are each responsible for all. Dostoevsky teaches two startling ideas through his mouthpiece, Father Zosima, the spiritual master and the brothers Karamazov, that we are all in paradise right now, though we don't see it, and that we are each responsible for all. Now, that's the last part that's really significant, that we're each responsible for all. Is that a scriptural teaching? Yes. It's very much about the whole idea of being the community of saints. So this is a profound thing. So then he follows up on this. Go to page 76, first full paragraph. The web of universal responsibility is also a basic vision of the novels of Charles Williams. Anybody familiar with Charles Williams? He was one of the Inklings. Who are the Inklings? Tolkien, Tolkien Lewis, Williams, Dorothy Sayers participated from time to time. So the Inklings was this group of guys who would read each other's literature and challenge each other, make fun of bad writers and this kind of stuff. So Charles Williams is part of that. And so you have three guys who have written stuff. Um, Williams wrote novels too. Um, in my opinion, of the three, Tolkien is by far the superior. Tolkien is an awesome novelist. Then comes Lewis. He's all right. Um, his, novelist, his novels are interesting, but they're not as not like Tolkien's. Then there's Williams, and he's, he's a distant ran third place, even behind Lewis. But he's, he's interesting. And if you haven't read Charles Williams, you should. Take a look at The Place of the Lion, um, but just be prepared for a good dose of Platonism, because that's where Williams is coming from. Um, but he's, he's pretty entertaining. All right, so Charles Williams, he calls it the city and contrasts the coherence of Zion with the incoherence of Gomorrah. So in other words, you know, this, in other words it's this, this bound togetherness of all this. Then the next paragraph, the tail end of that same paragraph, 
The relationships among the members of the city of God are organic, like the relationships among the cells in a single body. Brothers in a single real family, their love is founded on their being. We must love the brotherhood because we are the brotherhood. And far from impairing individuality, this relationship fulfills it. So then what he comes into the idea is that what will happen then in the eternity, in the eschatological fulfillment, is that the communion of saints will be brought to a new level and we will actually be living into and through the lives of others. Which is crazy, wild thought, but I have a hard time refuting it. Okay? So he gets into this in the bottom of 77. Not from without, but from within. Not by observing us, but by designing us. So we also fully understand others' lives, not by looking at them, but by living them. Not by sympathy, but by empathy. Perhaps we will be able to do this even with people who are still on earth, though through a kind of spiritual bilocation. Well, whatever. Or perhaps only through the coming alive of the person's memories in heaven. But since heaven does not move by earthly time, we'll be able to do this. So he's getting the idea that we actually live through the lives of others. And this is a crazy thought because, you see, then to be fully known, Scripture does talk that way. I will be fully known even as I am now fully known. And so it's not like we'll just hear stories, but we will actually live the lives of others and get it fully. So what others have experienced, we will actually get and share that through these kind of communal things. That's something I had never thought about is the possibility of the communion of saints. But like I said, I have a hard time refuting it. Why not? Coleman? I'm, I'm confused on the imagery you're using. Live through them? Not in... My, my thought goes to Adam and Eve prior to fall in that they are... No, fully no. Complementing each other in that. Is that what you're saying? Or is no, that? I'm saying that we, we will actually, in the communion of saints, we will know each other so well that we'll, and we'll have all eternity to do this, we can actually live through a, a, a person's life. So how did it feel when you lost your child? You're not just hearing the story, but you're living it with them. And we'll be able to do that because of the communion with us. And how did it feel when you, um, you know, brought the, preached the gospel to thousand people on that one day? Well, here's what it was like. You live in it. You do it. All right, it feels hit through systematics three. Yes, and see, they're there. And how did it feel to sin that grievously? What was that like? Well, here's what it was like. Ah, oh, I feel that with you. Man, that's horrible. And see, now he drags us into his whole purgatory thing and says, you know, that's purgatory is living. You know, you go, you're making your baby steps through this, and we don't need to go there. But I think the sense of this communion of saints, it, it's like I said, it puts a new spin on these kinds of things that who can conceive this stuff? And he just he points in some directions which I think are interesting. Uh, with that kind of understanding, uh, could we say we also know that the concerns of this life, of course, will be no more. There will be no more suffering, sorrow. Right. Like, but does that mean we'll still have memory? Yeah, but see, the suffering and sorrow even gets translated because, remember, Christ has eternal marks of the suffering, and the suffering is the glory. So even that stuff gets turned around. He talks about this in another place. Will there be sorrow? Who's to say? You know, isn't there something powerfully beautiful about sorrowful music that just like, Urgh! Something about this. I mean the memory of the sorrow that we experience versus experiencing sorrow there. Yeah, but what's the difference? I don't know. So the very, very bottom of 78. I know I'm running time. The last two lines. It seems likely, therefore, that we shall enter without limit fully into all the lives that ever were, are, or will be, not only on earth, but also of non-earthly creatures on other planets. Whoa, dude, whatever. All right. <laughs> so, Okay. So he, he makes some interesting moves. And in chapter 6, I think he makes some nice moves, you know, talking about what spiritual really means. And will there be bodies? Obviously, spiritual doesn't mean immaterial. Spiritual means in sync with God. And he's got that exactly spot on. So this just meant, is meant to kind of push some of your boundaries a little bit and make you think a little more freely and realize the eschatological fulfillment is really cool. And to try to think we got it figured out. No, you don't. And it's, it's interesting when a guy kind of pushes the boundaries a little bit, sometimes out of line, but... Also interesting.